All right. So Nancy, thank you so much for joining me today. It is my pleasure. I uh, love doing anything you're involved with. I appreciate it. And we're here to celebrate National Mentoring Month, which is every January. Um, and the aim of this month is to really unify and expand the mentoring movement, which I know is very important to you and very important to me. Um, and mentorship is really this place where, you know, we can we can quell systemic and growing inequity and allow burgeoning relationships that help with career, personal development, all those types of things. And so as um, my one of my mentors, I thought it'd be really fun to have a little conversation about what mentorship means to you, um, maybe a little bit about how we've been mentors in one another's lives and uh, just go from there. So um, for those who will be watching this and might not know who Nancy Lieberman is, uh, I have a little background on you. So Nancy is a two-time uh, Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Famer. She's currently a head coach in the Big Three, also does guest work for Valley Sports. Um, when she was a head coach in the Big Three, she won the 2018 National Championship, which made her the first female coach to ever win a men's pro league title, which is crazy. And she also took home the Coach of the Year honors that year. Um, Nancy's a two-time Olympian, a silver medalist, and her coaching career has extended through the NBA, WNBA, NBA G League, Big Three, and every step of the way you've broken barriers especially for women, elevated the profile of women in the game of basketball, but honestly sports overall, mm -hmm. and really helped the current and next generation of basketball players. Um, along with that, Nancy's a guest speaker for huge brands like Nike and FedEx and Bank of America and all these other huge places. And she is a uh, writer, she has her own books, and she also runs a nonprofit if she didn't already have enough things to do. And I think the important thing to mention about, you know, Nancy Lieberman Charities is that it really is a group that's focused on changing the lives of children in particular from urban neighborhoods that uh, through educational college scholarships, through mentorship, basketball camps, clinics, you know, racial and social justice lecture programs. Um, but most importantly, I think is your creation of dream courts and you're going to be creating your 128th this month, which has provided over 5 million children a community and a place to have joy and a safe place, place to play and do healthy activities. So um, that's uh, the shortest way that I can introduce you, I think. Um, and I really could go on and on about your accomplishments. Um, but uh, for those listening, you know, Nancy became my first female mentor. Uh, you know, I've been working in sports for 18 years and I was 10 years into my career when I finally had a woman that worked with me that did what I did to some extent. And it was really, um, it's a topic that I talk about often. If you hear me talk on in lectures or on guest speaking desks or on podcasts, I discuss Nancy continuously because of two reasons. One, the incredible guidance she's given me, but two, how 28 was way too late in my life to find a mentor that was a woman that sort of did similar to what I did. And I think by really expressing that out loud, I hope that it it allows other people to want to mentor and to be mentors to others so that we can start younger, we can start mentoring people and young kids and really like, you know, hone, hone in on the things that are important for them before they're kind of already partially through or established somewhat in their career. So with that, um, I want to hear from Lady Magic herself. The rest of the conversation is going to be Nancy talking. She has wonderful, wise wor words. And we're going to talk about what mentorship means to you and why it's important. So are you ready to dive in? Ready. I'm ready. Well, let, right. let me start by saying this. Mentorship yeah. is very important. I think anybody uh, worth their soul would like to help somebody else. Mm -hmm. And mentorship comes in, in different forms. It, it could be someone who's working on a daily basis with somebody. It could be somebody who is just starting and is not sure. You know, everybody started somewhere. Right. And you mentorship goes two ways. You have to ask for help, which is very important. And then that's the first thing, because if you ask for help, then the other person gets a chance to say, I'd like to help you, or I'd like to be part of mentorship to you. I think that's really important. And a, a big thing, even before I went to the NBA, I remember calling Pat Riley, who was my coach in, in 1980 you know, in the NBA uh, Lakers Summer League. It was a Southern California Pro League. And the really cool thing with Pat Riley is, you know, all these years later, 2015, you know, 16, I pick up the phone and call him and I go, Pat, 
I really think I'm ready for the next step of my career. I really think I'm ready to coach in the NBA. And he says, Nancy, this is fantastic, but we're not mind readers. You have to tell people what you want. And I thought that was just such sage advice to me. You know, I was in my 50s when he said that to me, but you do have to tell people what you want. Yeah. And we then have to understand a mentorship uh, could be emotional. It could be directly involved in your work. It could be how you communicate with other people. Communication is 360. It's not only talking, but it's listening. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think knowing that you're not alone, that somebody is there to double check you. Or I, I do it today as a, as a coach, as an entrepreneur, as somebody who's been accomplished. Um, I'll pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, I'm doing this. Would you just take a look at it for me? It, it doesn't mean I'm less. It's a strength, not a weakness to ask somebody for help. Some mentors have, you know, depending on where they are in their life, they have a lot of time to give. Some people don't have as much time, but will carve out, you know, once a month or once a quarter or, you know, you don't want to wear somebody, somebody out. But right. I, I think there's enough time to be able to give what you know, because what you know is really not yours to keep. It's yours to share. Yeah. And mentorship is is not only me saying to you, I think you should do this. It's even saying, if I believe in what you're doing, say, you know, have you thought about this? Um, I know somebody in that field. I'd be happy uh, to make a phone call on your behalf, but you must be ready for your moment. You know, don't oversleep. Don't, you know, show up that you've been drinking all night. Don't, I mean, you have to represent as well. Uh, so there's, yeah. there's two parts to mentorship. Well, you know, it's funny. Usually when people ask me why you were significant to entering my life, it goes back to something you said a couple of sentences ago. I, I said that Nancy gave me a pulse check I never had before, especially I think with women in male dominated industries, we can possibly feel like personally less than if we're maybe getting critiques about being aggressive or bitchy or bossy and those types of things, or we can feel like maybe we're not quite fitting in. And sometimes we realize that it isn't a self-confidence issue or isn't something personal. It could be like a systemic issue or it could be, you know, just um, microaggressions or other biases that sort of take place. And so for me, at least, I, I think that asking for help and saying what you need and then getting the kind of feedback that you're like, that maybe that you're not looking for, but that is important can also really place you in a better position, either personally or in your career to remind you that. It's not just you. I've yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, with most of that. But, you know, I, I see things a little less complex than that. I, I, I don't come in with all these, you know, things that, uh, when, I, when I'm when i especially dealing with women. Uh, I People have mind monsters. They like me. They don't like me. I did do my job. Did I do my job? They haven't called me back. Uh, I haven't gotten reinforcement. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it becomes a, a self-demeaning internal and you can't do that. You know, I'm a minimalist. This is what we're going to do. This is why we're going to do it. And these are going to be the results. Boom. And then mm -hmm. internally, we work towards those goals. I don't ever like sit by the phone and go, oh my gosh, you know, he didn't call me back. Or Don't worry about that. Take a breath. Just do your job. If right. you do your job, you will have success. There will be a metric of success. Uh, and I want to get back to you for a minute. So, you know, I had been around in a man's world my whole life mm -hmm. and m mostly any prominent job that I've ever had from ESPN to the NBA, to the G League, to playing in the USBL, uh, which was a men's basketball league for two years, every, uh, the big three with Ice Cube, every major opportunity I've, I've been hired by men. So it's important to me then to, Look at somebody like you who was young, working in a very male dominated alpha world and seeing that, you know, you were needing and you should have had some sort of feedback from the people that you're working with in the office there. Right. And to get better at what we do, we have to understand the culture of what is expected of us. And I, I really, as 
you know, my head is always on a swivel. So my third eye was on you, just seeing how you were doing. And I'd walk by your office, we talk, we close the door, you would tell me what's going on. And you, you trusted me. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's very important in life and in mentorship, you have to trust me. I'm not always going to say what you want to hear. But I'm going to tell you the truth. And I'm pretty yeah. much a straight shooter. As as you know, um, I'm a little bit of an alpha, but I, I care about people. And you were doing such an amazing job that sometimes in the workforce, guys are blowing and going. They don't realize, take a minute to give somebody some feedback and reinforce the fact that they were doing such great things for you. Mm -hmm. Men, it's hard. It's not easy working in the NBA or any other corporation. You've been on so many sides of that. And, you know, you're one of the smartest people I've ever been around and you're dogged in your approach and nobody is going to outwork you. Um, I, I admire you tremendously. You know, I didn't have a mentor uh, who was female when I was growing up. You know, I'm a girl from the 60s and 70s. We right. didn't have Title IX. We didn't have gender equity. We we didn't have a, a WNBA. You know, so everything that I did was revolved around men. So I think you know my skin is a little bit thicker because mm -hmm. I've been around guys and I have a lot of those traits. Like it just it's water off a duck's back. Um, I, I, so when I saw you, I was like, no, you know. Uh, the strength of the wolf is the pack and the strength of the pack is the wolf. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, when people say, you know, I'm a dog or when people say they're a dog and I go, good, I'm a wolf. Wolf eats dog. I'm a wolf and I'm going to protect my, my pack. And you were part of my pack. So, and most people now will say, I'm afraid of her, but you shouldn't be. So, you know, I, I see things maybe a little bit differently. Um, I'm, you know, we're trying to win and, and winning comes in different measurements. You know, you can throw out the metrics, the measurables, the outcomes, all the little buzzwords that people use in corporate, corporate America. You can't do your job if you're not good enough. You know, if I have a basketball team and I have five players, I agree with Michael Jordan. There's no I and win, right? Mm -hmm. Or he, what, what, what people say, sorry. There's no I in team, but there is an I in win. So if I have five people on my team, my job is to make every one of those people better, right? right? So now we're talking about the strength of the pack. And it is so important that we are out there working together to be successful. Mm -hmm. And that's, it doesn't matter if it's the Lehman Charities. It doesn't matter if it's the big three or coaching uh, with the Sacramento Kings or in the WNBA my job is to make people around me better. So mentoring often involves kind of helping instill really important values and life skills. I think that's how you can help make people better is to be really expressive about the things that are really important to you. So do you have any key values that you think are crucial to the success of your wolf pack, the success of your team, either on the basketball court or off? Um, and then how do you kind of incorporate that into your mentoring relationships? Well, that's that's a, a great thought that you have. You know, I tell people, don't love me, be loyal to me. Right. Right. Dogs are loyal. Be loyal to me in my worst moment. Stand up for me. Nobody's perfect. Uh, I see people. Oh gosh, I was in love with this person, and they were fantastic. And then I say, uh, you know, how's everything going? Oh, we haven't talked for three months. You know, there, there's no loyalty in sometimes in relationships, there's no loyalty in business. And it, it's it's really important. That's why I go back to the great companies, mm -hmm. to the great teams, to people who have been uber successful. I, I think about this. I've been friends with Warren Buffett since 1989. And I remember talking to him one time and I said to him, so you were before there was Berkshire Hathaway. You started Warehouse Inc. So why did you testify on the Hill, you know, um, in Washington for a company? And he says, I testified because they made a mistake. I testified because I'm loyal. Now, if they stole from me or cheated from me, I would not testify. But it, he did. 
and he testified for Goldman Sachs way back in the day. And I'm like, that's crazy. He goes, no, I will never fire anybody for making a mistake. I will never, you know, fire somebody for not being loyal. But if you lie to me and you cheat, you're done and you'll never work here. And I'm like the, the same way. Once I lose faith in you, once I know you don't have my back, you're not, I, I hate saying that, you know, the circle of trust, but that's really important in business. You've been down that road with people too. Yeah. I don't think I think differently than you there. Uh, loyalty. I mean, I'm an Aries too. I know loyalty is really important to fire signs in particular. Like loyalty has always been really important to me. You can't go anywhere without loyalty. Yeah. If you don't trust me, like when I was playing, if Marianne Stanley or Pat Riley didn't trust me, then they're not going to play me. They're not going to risk True. their job if I'm not all in. And I had to mm -hmm. lean in to different concepts and different business uh, sets, if you will, in basketball, everybody runs different offense, different defenses. Mm -hmm. It's not cookie cutter. So I had to adapt to, to what my coaches were telling me, which then helped me when I started coaching because mm -hmm. I had the Pat Summits, the Pat Riley's, uh, Bobby Knight, you know, uh, uh, you know, Billy Moore, Stu Gunner. I had all these amazing coaches and I could kind of cherry pick what is it that I believe in? What is it that I stand for? Mm -hmm. And then it's our job to do things over and over and over and over and over again. So it becomes a habit. And when things become a habit, this is the culture of what we do. So we might have a bad shooting night. We might not, you know, hit our quarter forecast for the year in business, but we're competing every day. We show up. We do our job. We help our teammates. Yeah. We communicate. You know, those are the things that help. Again, I go back to culture. You know, John Wooden had, you know, the pyramid. Mm -hmm. And the bottom of that pyramid has to be solid. And if that pyramid is upside down, now you're teetering. And you don't want to be, you don't want to be a Dow Joneser. I'm rich. I'm poor. I'm rich. I'm poor. You don't want to be that person. You want to be consistently consistent. Uh, on your on your worst day, you want to be better than people on their best day. Mm -hmm. And then if we we businesses like sports, if you if you don't hit your numbers, it doesn't mean you're a loser. It just means you have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what is that that you have to do to get you know to get that client or to run that offense or to get into the playoffs or. You, you can't win the championship if you don't get to the playoffs. Well, and I think that so everything really has a season. It's like the four quarters. Yeah. And I think that you do a really good job of staying like pretty even keel. I'd say that that's some of my favorite things about you is like when I've had, I've gotten less emotional, the older I've gotten, um, you know, I'm in my mid going to late thirties now, but when I was younger, it was hard to kind of not let that come in. And you always kind of gave me the really just like frank answer or a frank expectation. And it was sort of sometimes not what I wanted to hear in the moment, but I remember some of those words. So my next question is that there are lows in careers. There are lows in relationships. There's lows in life in general. So how do you kind of guide mentees through challenges and setbacks or teammates through you know challenges challenges and setbacks and help them build this resilience and maintain a positive mindset because I, I do think that Nancy you have a really positive outlook often and I think that's such something to be admired and definitely rubs off on other people so tell us some of those tools on kind of how you maintain that and how you can help people through challenges and setbacks I go back to something you just said about being emotional you were highly emotional you were young you were trying to get your That's foot sweet. you were trying to show people who you were and when you know again you're leading with emotion and and people around us are just like missing it they're not seeing right. some of the things that you needed so again i'm going to go back to a, a buffettism i remember warren buffett in the early 90s saying to me nancy do not ever make decisions based on emotion you'll almost positively make the wrong decision. He said in life, in love, in business, in coaching, in whatever you do, do not make decisions based on emotion. Can you see a, a team scoring seven points in a row and I, no, 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 
now I'm frazzled. I'm getting my team frazzled mm -hmm. instead of just going, okay, look, we're going to play through this or next time down, we're going to call a timeout. So your tone and your ten, you know, tenor with people, some people talk at a two and, you know, they're like, Ariel, mm -hmm. this is going to be okay. And then some people talk at a five and they're boom, boom, boom. And then there's some people like Dick Vitale who talk like this. Oh my God. Neither is wrong. Right. Neither is wrong. So, but I would say just if you find yourself like a little frazzled or emotional, take a break. Mm -hmm. If you're having, I know you and Matt never fight, wink, wink. If you're having a disagreement with your, your husband or your wife or whomever, sometimes it's okay to say, this has to end right now. I need an hour. We can reconvene. So you can get rid of that emotion in the moment because nothing good will happen if you're yelling and screaming at you, the people you work with or the players. Is You're not going to solve anything. My job as a mentor is to be a problem solver mm -hmm. and to help you. You still have to execute the work. But I certainly can help you with problem solving. And the greatest thing an employee can do is not wear me out as the boss or the mm -hmm. head coach. Because after a while, if somebody is always wearing me out emotionally, I'm going to shut down and I'm not going to be able to give you the best of who I am. So how do you and provide that guidance and allow your mentees to have the freedom to make their own decisions and learn from their experiences and not overtap you? Another great question um, that comes down to trust. Yeah. Uh, you can ask people who've been around me. I've been a micromanager, um, you know, first team all micromanaging my whole life. And then as I started, like I'm going to use Tracy who runs, you know, the charity uh, at first, you know, when she was interning and then, you know, she slid over into being a full-time employee, I didn't really trust her. I knew she had work to do, but sometimes you have to earn somebody's trust and that's okay. That's not, she hates me. No. And the more she showed her acumen and her preparedness and her intentionality and thinking outside the box, I don't want to be a robot. I don't actually want to be around people who are robots. Yes, I will do this for you, Miss Lee. No, that's a bunch of nonsense. Just tell me what you know. Tell me what you want to do, right? The 360 communication. Then I start thinking, wow, Oreo, you've done this with me, with, with the stuff you do for us. I'm like, no, let her just run with it. I'm not going to tell her what to do. Now, we look at what you do, and then sometimes the light goes on, and I'm like, hey, can you do this? Mm -hmm. And 99 out of 100 times you go, yes, I did that. You never say no. Tracy never says no. I've asked her to do so many things in business, even before she was prepared. And she just grasped it. Right. And it's okay. If you don't know something, YouTube. If you don't know something, Google. I, we didn't have this in my life. You actually have this right now. And it doesn't have to control you, but at least it'll give you a sense of direction. Don't call me if the stapler is broken. I don't have time to tell you it's in the cabinet. Go look. Mm -hmm. You know, it's little things like that. You know I'm a smart ass. Okay, yeah. so I'm sarcastic. I, I think I'm funny. My son says I'm not. But there's a lot of truth. That goes back to me being a minimalist. So, um, I think probably smart ass would play. I think oh, people yeah. actually want to be around people that laugh and can, you know, be like that. So I, mean, I, I, I always laugh about the first time that you uh, scared the living daylights out of me because we were driving in my car uh, in Sacramento to get your hair done. And you cracked that joke at me and I thought I had morally offended you and I was groveling and apologizing. And then you just started to laugh and you're like, oh, I'm just messing with you. So all the time. Yeah, you, you know what? It's okay to make people happy. I wake up happy. When I get up in the morning, I think, what can I do to inspire somebody? When, you know, and TJ knows this, my son, when my little shades open, 
my little lids and the good Lord gives me another day on this earth, mm -hmm. I think what can I do for somebody? My smile makes you smile. It doesn't cost anything, but it, right? Nonverbal communication. Mm -hmm. And of course, Nancy being Nancy, I always tell people, uh, like I just said, my smile makes you smile. Just smile. Even no, no judgment. If you have no teeth, no judgment. It's okay. I just, and so I do, I use it and joke around a little bit, but you, you, somebody who doesn't look like you, maybe somebody has tattoos or piercings or this or that. And I'm just like, hi, how are you? Hey, did that hurt? I tell, can you get a second? Can you tell me, like, I, I don't like needles. I don't even like flu shots. So I engage people that are different than me. Yeah. Because I, one, I'm interested. Two, I know I'm going to make a joke. Three is going to, you know, clear, clear uh, the, the air of anything heavy. And then a total stranger who I don't know, I'm going to have, you know, a nice interaction with them. Um. Yes. I don't think that I've ever been around you a day without me cracking a smile or you cracking a joke. And even if TJ doesn't think they're funny, I think they're funny. Um, look, I know that you've got a hard deadline because you've got to get on desk tonight, I believe. Um, but let's just finish off with one quick question for young athletes that are aspiring to follow in your footsteps. What advice do you have for them for seeking and benefiting from mentorship opportunities? I think the first thing, um, matter of fact, I don't think I know the first thing, if, if you're a young athlete, be around people that are better than you seek them out. Okay. Uh, if you're a gal playing basketball, go play basketball against guys. If you're track, if you're women, find guys, whether it's tennis or what, whatever the sport, it's going to make you better. It changed my life. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, you know, if you're men, just find guys who are bigger, better, stronger, faster. So you're pushing yourself to another level. Don't worry about the score. Don't worry about winning the race because they're gonna win the race for you because they're gonna take you up to another level. Mm -hmm. And that has happened for me every step of the way. You just don't wake up and go, yeah, damn it, I'm a woman, I'm a chick, I'm a coach in the NBA. No, there are steps you have to take. And a lot of time, and I'm not throwing shade on this generation because Man, I just love this generation and, and admire so many young people. But it's like you want to leapfrog and forget like some of those crucial steps. Now you can leapfrog frog some things, but there's some things you just got to go through and to know, and then you'll know how to fix it. Uh, it's it's whether it's it's business, whether it's sports, and you know I'm in a trillion dollar industry. I'm in the industry of sports, just like you are. So it's very competitive and compete. Just feel good about yourself. I'm going to close on this. When um, my mentor was Muhammad Ali, I fell in love with Muhammad Ali when I was 10 years old. I read everything I could on him. Uh, as, as you know, the story, I make the U.S. team at 16 years old. Um, I'm a junior in high school on the Pan Am team, Pan American team. We win the gold medal. Then I'm the youngest Olympic basketball player ever. I was 17 when we won the silver medal in, in Montreal. But when my first interaction with Ali, you know, I was like, hey, I'm Nancy Lieberman. Old Dominion just won our first national championship. I'm player of the year in college basketball. After talking to me for five minutes, Muhammad Ali knew that I was broken, that whatever the, the press or the people knew about me, I, I, I was fraudulent. He knew that I didn't love myself mm -hmm. and I was hiding behind being Nancy Lieberman, but I was hiding behind this sport that was blessing me. The greatest thing that I can share with you that Ali gave me was learn to love yourself, right? I decided long ago, never to live in anyone's shadow. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I'll live as I believe, no matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity because the greatest love of all is inside of me. I didn't love me. So I was damaged goods. I was emotional. I was combative. I was, you know, mad at the world. It wasn't until I learned to love me that I took myself to another level. And that gave me that consistency that we're talking about. And that's one of the greatest things that you can have. Just trust your instincts. 
prepare yourself for success, somebody's going to get the job. Somebody's going to make the team. Somebody's going to be a multimillionaire. Why not you? It can happen. Just think, I want to have intentional greatness. And if you believe it, it'll happen. You have to see it. You have to say it to be it. Mm -hmm. I had to see myself. It had never happened before in the history of USA basketball. There was no model for me to follow. But by golly, you know, I every day I was brushing my teeth and I'm like, I'm going to be on that Olympic team. I'm going to be wearing number 10. And it happened. And when it happened, it was like I had been there in my mind. See it, say it. I'm going to be on the Olympic team. I'm going to be on the Olympic team. Like you, you speak it into the universe. And then there I was in 1976 on that podium, bending over and having that medal put around my neck. And it was the way it was supposed to be. And it will be that way for you. Well, let's just end it there because I can't top that. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope that you have a wonderful time on desk. And if I haven't told you a million times before, thank you for being in my life. Well, I love you. I appreciate you. I admire you. And now I got to go do the Thunder game against yeah, Atlanta. Yeah, do work. <laughs> thank you. All right. Love you too. Bye. Bye.